Welcome back to the Young Shakespeare Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Bennett. And today I have the pleasure of talking to Joshua Morissette. He's a star player, averaging about 19 points per game over at Exeter. He's a Wofford commit. Uh, Josh, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. What was it like deciding that you were going to play Division One basketball at Wofford? I think for me, it was a, one, it was a dream come true. I've dreamed of it since I was a little kid. Um, and with Wofford, I had a great relationship with the coaches right away. They were calling me all the time. And when I went on a visit, they kind of pulled out the whole red carpet on an unofficial. Mm -hmm. I was golf carted around the campus. <laughs> um, I got to play pickup with the team. And then I was like brought into a room where it was like future Terrier, Josh Morissette. And like they had an offer I hadn't even like said I was committing yet. Wow. Um, and then the next week I got the offer. And the next day I talked with my parents, my brother, um, kind of my whole family. And we just decided Wofford was the place for me. And I, I was ecstatic. I was so excited. It's crazy, man. So you walked in and it just had the future Terrier. <laughs> it did. I was in the coach's office. Um, and then, you know, they had videos from like, obviously on like what they do, like their style of play, offense, defense, and they kept pausing it. They're like, and this is where we see you fitting in. Like we see you filling the wing here, hitting a three. We see you guarding this player off ball, causing havoc. And I'm just sitting there like kind of in shock. I didn't know what to say, nothing. It was a great, it was a great experience. Wow, yeah, t totally the red carpet. That, that's like a great sales pitch. I mean, you'd be able to show yourself and visualize, like did they have you put a uniform on and everything? Um, on my official visit in at kind of the end of August, early September, mm -hmm. I got to take pictures in the uniform. And even then I went back to that same coach's office and they did the same thing. They had videos, but this time they cut up videos of myself as well in tournaments. So after they showed, showed me what they want me to do, they had a video of me actually doing that in a game from a live stream that they watched. No kidding. And I, I was in shock. That is, yeah, that is shocking. That's crazy, dude. Oh I'm, my God. I'm sitting in those chairs just speechless on like the amount of effort they put in. What, what was it like telling your family when uh, presumably you got a call? I mean, what was it like telling the people that matter to you the most that you're like, hey, I got this offer, this great, amazing offer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was at the NEPSAC showcase when I got it, and parents couldn't go, so it was all live streamed. Mm -hmm. And after the game, I kind of I walked by the coaches. I wasn't sure if they were allowed to talk to me or not, but like I said hi, obviously. Um, and that's when they told me they're like, "Hey, you now have a Wofford scholarship." Oh my god! And <laughs> I think like the smile on my face might have gave it away because like my parents said they could like see the biggest smile on my face yeah. as I was walking to like meet with our team. And then right after our team meeting, I'm getting like a phone call from my dad who was also on the phone with Coach Karate of Magic. Mm -hmm. And it's like a joint phone call. Yeah. And they were, they were all so excited. My whole family's in the living room. I'm like, is that why you were smiling like this, that? And I was like, yes, it is. Like they told me right after the game. And it was a special moment. And then I had to make a few phone calls that night and everyone was so excited. Oh, that's spectacular. That's such a great moment. I thought, imagine you've been, you've been too excited and you just walk in front of the live stream camera, like mom, dad, I got this off <laughs> like in front of everyone. <laughs> oh, I could have, that would have been a great way to do it. I won't lie. Great story. Oh yeah. Get it on camera and everything. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Talk. So are you, are you tight with coach karate? I am. I am. Yeah. Tell me, everyone's got a take on him, and I'd love to hear yours because I'm interviewing him in like a week or two. And everyone I've talked to has just essentially said in so many words, Coach Crotty is the man. Yeah, I would, use, I would probably use those exact same words. Um, all seriousness, like he is the man. As a coach, he lets you kind of play your game. Um, obviously, as a program, like they've definitely developed into one of the top programs in the country. Um, my or like my team, like Dom, Will Bachelor, Brady Cummings, Mike, and you can go down the list. Um, was ranked 22nd, and you have your system. Um, you have like the plays you're gonna run, but he just lets you play your game. And then off the court, he's kind of like still a little kid. Um, mm -hmm. He's gonna crack a joke. He's gonna make you laugh on the bench just out of the blue, and you don't expect it. And then even in a car, he's easy to talk to. Mm -hmm. um, he's getting phone calls from alums from way back. I remember I was in a call with like Pat Connington 
and they're just talking like their best friends like it didn't matter that they that karate was his coach and now i have that relationship with him where coach karate will call me up out of the blue and we'll just talk and nah he, he's the best is like yeah. simply simply the best way to put it yeah i i asked him uh on a phone call with him i said uh coach what's the proper time for someone to start considering you know when should someone consider playing middle six magic and trying out and stuff and he goes the answer to that question dan is as soon as you're born you should consider the middle six magic <laughs> yes yes i can't say enough good things about that program yeah though the, the only tough thing now must be graduating stuff that you don't get to have the uh, the under armor sponsorship it's too bad you gotta miss out on that. <laughs> i know i'm trying to uh pull some strings with them to maybe get a shoe box here or there on my front porch, yeah. maybe a jacket. Um, I don't know if he's really pulling in that direction with me yet, but um, I'm definitely working on something with him. Yeah. Well, what, who's uh Wofford's uh, shoe sponsorship? Uh, we're Adidas. Adidas. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. You'll, oh, you'll probably just get loaded with gear. <laughs> loaded. That's what I was being told. So I, I had a, unfortunately it fell through, but I, I interviewed Brevin Galloway from the BC basketball team over the summer. And then we were supposed to do another one when he came to Raleigh, cause I go to NC state. And when he was playing against state, he, we were going to do an interview in his hotel room. His flight got delayed and it fell through, but I took, I, I bought this t-shirt BC, BC basketball for the interview. Cause and BC has been so good to me with Gianni and, and Jonathan. So I was like, well, I got to rep the, rep the squad. So I, I was excited and I sent him a picture. I said, Hey, just like I promised, because they um, – now I'm getting in the backstory more, but I was at the NC State versus BC football game in Chestnut Hill, and I stood in the BC student section wearing my bright red NC State Wolfpack shirt, and the basketball team walked by, and I was like, hey, guys. And they are like – I was excited to see them, and they are like, what are you wearing? And I was like, well, you, when you guys come down, I promise I'll be wearing uh, a BC shirt. So I sent this picture to them. I was like, oh, I got this shirt. And he's like, Dan, what are you doing? He goes, I could have just brought you a shirt. So lo long story short, like you had, I was like, oh, you can just give out shirts. Like you're, you're going to be like a merchandise stand. As soon as you get to Wofford, you're going to have a million things. Yeah, it's going to be fun. And true story. I was at that same football game, probably standing in the same student section as you were. No kidding. Yeah. So no my kidding. brother played baseball at BC. Um, so he went back for that game. And I went with him. You, you may have seen me. I was acting like an asshole the whole time. I was like, go pack. I was getting flipped off. I, someone told me, a, a lady, because I bumped into her outside of the stadium, one of the only, one of the lone wolves in the stadium. And she was like, yeah, there's, they said something over the loudspeaker about a kid in a red shirt in the BC student section. They're like, they were like, I guess called me out in the stadium. Someone said like, oh, there's an NC student student in the student section. I, which I thought was hilarious. It was like the craziest thing I've ever been a part of. Yeah, that's awesome. Causing, <laughs> causing trouble. Causing trouble. So you actually, you do come from a very athletic family. I, I, I do. About that. Break it down for me. Yeah, so both my parents um, played sports growing up. My dad played college basketball at Puma State. Um, my mom played college softball and basketball as well um, at Plymouth. Mm -hmm. um, and then they both went on to become coaches. My dad was a college basketball coach at the Division Three level for about 25 years. Um, and then my mom works over at Exeter High School, and she coaches softball and volleyball over there. And then my brother, he grew up playing football, basketball, and baseball, so I followed in his footsteps in those three sports. But he went the uh, baseball route mm. and committed to BC his sophomore year before getting drafted this past summer to uh, the Miami Marlins in the second round. Wow. Wow. Who's the best athlete in the family? You're, you're talking to him right now. <laughs> you're a beast. <laughs> oh, my God. I can only imagine the fucking pickup games and, the, <laughs> and the, the shit you guys must have gotten into as a family growing up playing sports. Not only like sports, though, like we have we play family Yahtzee after dinner and we're so competitive. We have a scoreboard on the inside of the Yahtzee box and like we're tallying each win we have. Um, we play like cribbage, which is a cards game. And you have that 
my dad and I have a ping pong series going <laughs> and it's everything like you name it you do not want to lose so like that's just kind of how I grew up oh bro I'm the same way with my family like my brother and I terrible at chess we don't know the first thing about chess but we had like a a hundred game series going where it was like, I was like neck and neck, like 54 to like whatever, 46. Like I was up of course. So, but it's just like, yeah, you grow up like competing and that's, that's the way it's gotta be. What, what was it like seeing your brother get drafted? It was unbelievable. You know, I, I would say it was a dream come true for like, obviously him, but for all of us, just because, you know, you, you kind of sit back and you watch the nights where he's got the car lights on hitting in our batting cage or like staying late after practice to take some extra ground balls. And you just saw the work that he put into it. So to kind of be there for that moment, hear his name called and everything, it was special. And I was worried because he was like a projected first or second round. And for the first round, I was in Florida waiting for a plane after a basketball tournament. Um, oh no. <laughs> for magic. So I'm like watching the draft on the plane with no sound, I'm like trying to read the uh, commissioner's mouth on who's getting drafted. And it was something I didn't want to miss, but like if he went in the first round, I was like, all right, I'm gonna celebrate this even if I'm not with you right now, cause that's special. Uh -huh. But I, I was able to get home and hear his name called that next day with everybody. Oh, wow. Yeah, and what was like, what was the atmosphere? Like, did everyone just freak out and celebrate? Yeah, I think. He kind of got a tip. He got a text from a few of one of his agents that like, hey, the Marlins are about to take you if you're still on the board. So I forget who the pick before was, but when they didn't take him, I think all the phones came out. We could feel it. And it was kind of like that sigh of relief too, because like the build up to the draft, all the talk. Um, I think it got to him, it got to all of us. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of that sigh of relief. All right, this is over. We know what's coming. And he was excited. We're all excited. Yeah, yeah. It's not, not a bad place to be, too. Not at all. Not a bad place to be. The Marlins, dude. That's a nice place. That's a nice place, dude. And, and what, what level? Do you know what level he's going to be playing at this next year? Hopefully he starts in high A ball. Um, okay. He's been, like, low single A this past summer. Um, but he had a really good like training camp and spring training starts soon. So if he does well, hopefully he'll get moved up. Wow. Yeah. I have no idea how it works, uh, but that's very cool to just be, to be in the organization and all that shit. Oh my God. So you guys, are you going to be able to see him play while you're off at college? Like are there, are there going to be opportunities and stuff like that? I, I guess hope in the so. summer there's plenty of time. Some of there will be some time. Um, he has some off season too, and he's already telling me I'm gonna be at all of your games that I can be at. Um, he already has a few of his kind of weekends planned out for next year to get down to Wofford or wherever we're going. And you know, hopefully he makes it up big because I know Atlanta isn't too far away, so I can go catch a Marlins Braves games mm. at some point. Yeah. Do, by any chance, do you know Jonathan Steelman? I do not. on the Wofford basketball team. I think it's Jonathan Steelman, something like that. Oh, okay. That's too bad. Yeah. It might, it might be a senior or something like that, but I interviewed his sister. Who's actually like one of the fastest cross country runners in the NCAA. And so Dude. she, it's pretty cool. Cause that, that's like another athletic family. Her brother um, is just like on the Wofford basketball team. I think two of her brothers might've been at some point. See if I can find a picture. I don't, I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to spend too much time on that. It's crazy. <laughs> Tell me about your boy Dom committing to Notre Dame while we're on the topic. What was yeah. that like seeing your boy get all those offers? Well, playing next to him like all spring and summer, like you could see it. It was coming at some point. Um, you know, he had an unbelievable game against Expressions, where I think it first started for him. I think we went down to Dallas and he lit it up, mm. like unstoppable. And then they all came. So just sitting there, like, obviously, everyone knows he's a great basketball player. But what a lot of people don't know is he's an even better, like, friend mm -hmm. off the court. So, like, him and I got really close. And to, like, sit there to see what he was, like, going through, to see what he was achieving was special. And then I got, like, the text before he put it out, like, hey, I just committed. 
And I go to where? He goes, you're gonna have to wait and find out. Ooh. And I go, no, nah, you're not gonna do that to me. <laughs> like you were the first, you were one of the first to know before I put it out there. So you're gonna tell me. <laughs> um, he was like, all right, I'm going to Notre Dame. And like a huge smile came on my face. Like I, f- I kind of figured that's where he was gonna, leaning towards, that's where he was gonna go. He was always talking about it, but to hear him finally just say it um, and tell me it, it was special. And, you know, I could tell he was happy. I was happy for him. His family was happy. And again, it, it, was, it was a special moment for him uh, and to like be able to share that with him. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, he can't be teasing you like that. Exactly. Hey, that, that's you can't be I sending was. a text, hey, I committed. And right? Like, <laughs> I was like, what, what do you mean you're not going to tell me now? Oh, dude, dude, it, it dude. definitely took some persuading to uh, get, get him to tell me. <laughs> Yeah, you know what's crazy, too, that I, like, now that I'm learning more about, like, how all this works is just the amount of people, like, when you start getting these D1 offers that are literally tracking you and stuff, like um, Preston Zinter from uh, Central Catholic, I don't know if you would have heard about him, but he committed to play football at Notre Dame, and I don't know how, but, like, some website, it was on 247 or something, figured out he was going to commit there, like, two days before, I was like, how the hell, how the hell do they know? But there's like, I guess like when the eyes are on you, the eyes are on you. Exactly. Mm, yeah. It is, was that pressure at all, the choosing? Or was it more just excitement because you're like, it, like almost similar to your brother with the baseball where you're relieved, where you're like, hey, I'm getting these offers. Like my childhood dream, like you mentioned, is to play D1 basketball. I'm going to be able to do it. I think it was a little pressure bit of both. Um, I think it was both because obviously for like the class of 2022, you had the COVID stuff going on. So like you had that pressure where it was like when the coaches are there, you got to perform um, because there's not many tournaments that the coaches are going to be at. Mm. But at the same time, it's like, for me, at least, I wasn't worried about how many offers I got. I was just worried about kind of getting that right fit school for me, mm. both academically and athletically. And when I finally got that, it was definitely like that relief, like, all right, I did this, like all this stress, all this pressure that I felt for the past year is gone. Mm -hmm. And like all summer, I was able to just go to tournaments and play and like kind of be free, not have that stress of what eyes are on me or anything. True. The the Wofford uniforms are clean too. Yes, they are. They're clean. Yes, they are. They got a nice, I wore the nice white one and um, for my pictures, but they got the gold and also like a clean black uniform so yeah who what conference is Walford in? For, forgive me on my ignorance from that yeah no they're in the southern conference mm-hmm. yeah and who's like the main competition like the rival mm-hmm. so the rival is Furman mm-hmm. um Furman I think Furman actually got them twice this year once Furman got them pretty good at Walford and then the second matchup that Furman came down to the wire um and they beat them by one but other teams like Chattanooga is the top of the conference right now. Then UNC Greensboro um, is another top team. Oh, man. Yeah. If, you know what? If there's a matchup with NC State, I'm going to have to come out for that. Hey, <laughs> in the Carolinas, you never know. Yeah, it could, dude, it could be easily. Because I know like Furman played NC State in football. And um, yeah, and there's plenty of basketball games. So if it's on the, it's on the calendar, I got to gotta come out. I'll, exactly. Uh... <laughs> Exactly. Show you the show you the town. Show you Raleigh. It sounds good. Oh geez. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up because it was all of an hour ago that I think this was said. I was talking to my boy Logan Big L from Andover, um, not Phillips Andover, but Andover High, um, who's ranked number three going into the MIA D1 tournament. And we were talking about if you took all the best kids from the NEPSAC ISL and all the best kids from the MIA and split them on the teams and played who would win. And he said he thought that the MIA kids would actually win. What's your reaction to that? No. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It it depends like what you're talking about. Cause like, you think about it? You got the Brewster kids, you got the Putnam science kids, you got the NMH kids all going kind of high major, but then you kind of go down the list and you go to Worcester who's got four high major guys um Cushing and all these teams and like I don't know if people like forget these are all nutsack then you come to our league where you have Hotchkiss 
who's got Ivy League to mid mid majors to high majors with Loomis, us, Saint Sebs, mm. and like I'm not trying to like this Massachusetts because like a lot of my boys play in it. I think it's great. I think it's one of the top leagues. I think it is the top league in New England mm. um, for like public schools and everything. But if you think of NEPSAC, it's guys coming from all over the country and like Brewster's getting people from all over the world to come play for their program who are four stars, five stars. So I feel like <laughs> you just put them on one team, it wouldn't be fair. <laughs> I love your reaction. No, <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect, dude. The, yeah, and the, the that's that's actually you you've laid it out very good. The one thing that was persuasive to me, just about the MIAA, is that there's literally a million teams. Like they have hundreds of high schools. So I was like, could you get together five kids from those schools? Like if you got the boy Mike Lochnane, like all these guys, like. It'd be a good squad, but now that I hear you break it down, I mean, doesn't sound like it'd even be competitive. And obviously, <laughs> the the argument I always love to bring up too, and I think most of the MIA kids that I interview when I bring it up, they're like, I don't think we'd stand a chance. Who was I talking to? It was uh, I think it was Franklin High School, maybe, who's about number fifth in D one and MIA. And those kids were like, Yeah, like I asked them, like, Hey, what would the score look like against Milton Academy? And they're like, Milton Academy would beat us by fifty points. Like, <laughs> we didn't even be close. <laughs> Oh. yeah yeah it's interesting food for thought you know what i mean um, exactly what have you played milton what do you think of those that that squad yeah that that team's good um it's kind of like just the magic 10th grade team <laughs> no i'm just kidding they do have a lot of the kids though <laughs> um well now 11th grade team but no they got a really good squad they play really really good basketball uh they, be, they beat us by two earlier in the year um at our place you know, they have a bunch of guards who can move it. They can shoot the ball. They're quick. And they got a solid big and CJ. Mm. And I forget their other kid. I think he's a football kid who, who is re actually really solid. Um, oh, it's – um, yeah, that's uh, Andrew Rapp. Yes. You know, he, you need to get a rebound. He got it. Mm. And, you know, they play – they play with so much energy and passion. Like, they – they kind of figured, hey, we might be the underdogs here. Let's go make our name heard. And they did it. Um, I'm definitely looking forward to getting another shot at them on Wednesday in the playoffs. Um, they're coming to our place again in a 4-5 or five matchup. Uh, so kind of hoping to get some revenge. But it, I know and we know it's going to be another tough matchup because they can fill it from three and they they play really good basketball. Mm. Yeah, and, I, and forgive me on this because I've had people explain it to me a million times on the podcast, but how does the playoffs work in the NEPSAC? Can you explain this to me? Break it down a little bit. Yes. So they choose like the top eight teams um, from – so we're Class A, so like the top eight teams from Class A. Um, but pretty much it's not like by record or like winning percentage. They kind of have like a committee that goes through – kind of like your top wins or like your top class A wins and they like seed you by that. And obviously the top two teams this year were Hotchkiss and St. Sebs. They were both undefeated. They were getting that one, two spot. And then I think Belmont Hill is the, th they're the three seed. They were 10 and three and we were nine and two. So like winning percentage wise, we have the better record, but one, one they beat us. So they, they jumped us. So like we got the four, then it goes like Milton the five, who beat a lot of good teams, mm -hmm. and like Little Miss, Trinity, Pauling, and Berkshire. Yeah. So pretty much a group of people get together and just see the top eight teams that they think. Interesting. That's that's kind of weird. That's kind of arbitrary for all the complaining people do about the MIAA. The fact that I mean, do you like that? Do you think it's better when you don't have some sort of like algorithm and that it's actual humans, so that if there's something observable they can kind of point it out? Or do you think that it leads to bullshit because you have a room full of people that have biases and interests and stuff like that? I like it just because, you know, maybe if you're playing your best basketball at the end of the year, someone can see that. Um, and maybe like you may have started with a few losses early against some like the top four teams, mm -hmm. right? But then like you kind of beat five, six, seven, eight, but maybe because of those losses, you're on the outside looking in. 
and someone can like recognize that and see that. Right. And so then from here, it, it just becomes like an eight man tournament. It's like yeah, eight, it's the elite eight, eight and then you're working towards the, the final four and the championship and everything. Exactly. Damn. So then who, so if you guys, let's say you beat Milton, where's the other team? Does it get reseeded or do you know what the next opponent would be or where they come we from? You would play Hotchkiss or Berkshire. Mm, okay. And Hodgkiss is ranked higher? Yeah, so Hodgkiss is the one seed. Word. Okay. I got to interview someone from there. I get in on this tournament. Yeah, that team's really solid. Who were, um, who were some of the good players on Hodgkiss? We didn't play them this year. Um, I just remember them playing them at the Nepsack Showcase. Um, but I'm pretty sure they have a guard going to Yale. And just like Milton, they play really good basketball. They're athletic. Um, they can speed you up defensively and they, they play with energy that if you don't match, you're going to get blown out in the first 10 minutes of the game. <laughs> wow. That's tough. To, that's tough to compete against. Exactly. So, Jeez. Jeez. And how about, uh, Sebs? Who does Sebs have? Um, well, they got Trevor Mullen, mm -hmm. who enough's been said about him. He's unbelievable. I've played against him. <laughs> And then I don't know the eighth grader's name. It's uh, AJ Benista or something. It's like something the number one eighth grader in the country. Yeah. He's unbelievable. Our, our coach described him as he's a professional basketball player when he's older. Um, Jesus. And can't say it enough. They play unbelievable basketball. Their crowd travels. I haven't seen a student section travel in NEPSAC basketball like St. Seb's. Mm. They're playing at Babson and um, an early little tournament, and they had a whole section just filled for students. And wherever they go, they got it. Playing at Dana Barros, the whole bat or um, the whole area behind the baseline filled with students, flags, everything. They travel well. Um, they always got their school behind them. Mm -hmm. So that's crazy. Do you have a rank? Did you ever get ranked? Like in the top hundred. Yeah, well, no, you know, like 247 sports, they ever throw you a rank or anything like that? Not that I've seen. I never really paid too much attention to that, yeah. honestly. You're, not, you're number one on my list. So Thank, you. There, Thank you. there you go. No, I was just wondering because that's what always trips me up is when they know, like, who the number one eighth grader in the country is. I'm always like, how the fuck do they know that of all exactly. the eighth graders? But it kind of turns out like they do. Like when they're, they'll rank like Zion Williamson, like number one when he's like, a sophomore in high school whatever. like they figure out who's who like very pretty accurately to be honest like if you look at like the ESPN top 100 list and all of a sudden they can like predict I mean so obviously some guys bust and then there's some guys who would have never seen that list that end up being stars in the NBA but a lot of the guys that are stars in the NBA come out of that list so I'm like how do they how do they figure that out I know it, it's pretty impressive what they can do mm, yeah but yeah so that's fine He's a future professional basketball player. So what is in NEPSAC, like in a NEPSAC game, does he stand out or is it because he, if he's in eighth grade, I think someone who I had, I think it was a Milton player explained this to me, seeing a play that he was like very good, but there's still, he still needs to develop because he's playing against like men. Is that, is that kind of the sense you've gotten? I'm not the person to ask just because I haven't really seen him. Mm -hmm. Um, because we we didn't get the chance to play him. Yeah. Oh, I think we're I'm. There's a game I might watch actually that St. Sebs Milton game to get ready for Wednesday, but um, online or anything I haven't seen him play just yet. Yeah, coming off of that, um, Milton Academy losing a tough one to them. What do you think you guys need to do differently to grab a win this time? Yeah, so when we played them, it was kind of early in the season where nothing was, like, fluid for us. Um, every kind of week, we're having a distraction, either COVID, either a game getting canceled, this or that. And so at the time, we had, I think, like, two or three practices going into the game where Milton's already played four games. Um, so it was, like, it was early for us, not saying Milton, like, didn't beat us because that day they were the better team by far. Um, but I think this time 
we kind of have the flow now. Um, we've had a solid last month. Practice is going really well. We're moving the ball a lot better. We're kind of going inside out, um, getting the ball to Dom a lot. Mm -hmm. And then he's finding open teammates. So I think this time we just want to be us. Um, the first game defensively in the first half, we were not good as well. Um, we didn't really show up. So we've been really working on playing a full 32 minute game. And we've been doing that recently. So just kind of focus on playing the 32 minutes, getting out of the gates fast and hot um, and really sticking to it defensively because our defense has won us a lot of games this year. Mm, mm, for sure. Talk about what Dom, you know, we talked about your personal relationship with him and sort of that special moment, right, when he was committing to Notre Dame. Talk about him as a player on the court and what he brings to the table in, in games. Yeah, you know, there's a lot. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't know where to start. Obviously, he's big, he's strong. You know, you get it to him in the paint, he can finish. Um, but he can also step outside and knock down a three, maybe hit like a pull-up jumper here or there, handle it a little bit. Um, for us, he's done a really good job kind of being a stress relief where we've been able to hit him at the top of the key to get into our offense. Um, and then defensively, I don't think I've seen a person get six or seven blocks in a game before until yesterday at Andover, where right out of the gate, he had a block, like first possession. And then whenever someone kind of got in the paint near him, it was either getting sent off the backboard, it was getting sent to a, one of us running out. Like, it was crazy to see. Um, so he brings, he brings a lot, but he brings someone who's going to finish, who's going to knock down a shot. And who's going to be a rim protector better than anybody. Yeah. And what's fascinating about that, too, getting six or seven blocks is, like, at that point, you'd, I have to imagine that it's not just the blocks is the baskets he's um, preventing from happening, but just the fact that if you know it's getting swatted, you kind of eliminates a major part of the game that you're just going to be less willing to drive in and take that risk. Again, it's sent into exactly. the fifth row. Exactly. <laughs> Oh my God, what a what a beast, dude. Jesus. Wow. Um, yeah. And then do you do you ever match up on him in practice? I mean, I assume your buddies. What how how does that go down when you guys match up on each other? I, I we we've never like five on five been matched up against each other. Maybe a little this fall. Yeah. Well, um, I know you're like di you know, different positions, but yeah. like you guys ever play one on one? Like that's what I'm at you asking. Yeah. Like, so when we do that, you know, he'll back me down. He'll he'll be that guy, obviously. You know, he's a little bigger than me. I won't lie. Well a lot bigger than me. So he's a little big down, spin move layup. Um but when I'm on offense I'll kind of take him to the perimeter and make him guard. Mm. Um I can get by him and finish. Um, I think I've stolen it from him a few times. He's blocked me a few times, but um, we each have a strength that the other person can't really stop. So now he will never admit that though. That's the best part. You know, I'll at least admit, sit here and say, no, I can't guard Dom in the post. You know, he's going to tell you, oh my God, I would lock Josh up on the perimeter. Like, I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> um, that's who he is. Um, I'll always say, yeah, but I'm going to beat you in, like, the game anyways. Like, the second I get the ball, you're not stopping me. He goes – then he'll say, well, I won't give you the ball. I'll just back you down every time. Mm. So, that that's who we are. We we never give each other credit. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, and tell me a little bit about uh, the rest of the guys on the team. What else uh, does Exeter bring to the table? Who are some of the names and faces people should look out for? Yeah, so Adam Hinton committed to Cornell. Um, <laughs> Athletic as hell. Uh, he can get up, uh, shoots it really well, pretty good handle, really good mid-range. Um, defensively, he's good, too. He's going to go get a rebound when we need him to. And then you have Chandler PJ, who's committed to Harvard. Um, so that's another post-grad. Adam's also a post-grad. Post but Chandler's one of the best defenders I've ever seen. You know, you need to stop or you want someone to guard the other team's best player, he's going to get it. Um, he's going to get a rebound. He gets downhill both ways, and he's going to finish with either hand. Uh, his jump shots come a long way from the start of the season now. Uh, he's really worked on it. Um, he's hitting mid-range jump shots left and right and, you know, knocking down threes. And then I think our 
three guard, our other three guards, you have Derek Caps, who's another post grad. Um, he's just solid. Um, he's gonna, he gets the ball in tight spaces with passes that you never expect. He's quick. He can get by a defender. And then, you know, he can also stay in front of a quick guard, kind of get them out of their rhythm a little bit. And then we have two juniors, Raleigh, Castanera. Raleigh, if you're, you watch this, I apologize if I said your last name wrong. <laughs> um, knockdown shooter, runs the offense really well. Um, hits ahead. He's really solid. He's got a bright future. And same with Paulo Belfiore, who's one of another one of my good friends as well. Just like all these guys, um, that this kid Paulo, his energy is unmatched as well. You, he will lock you up on defense, full court right away. He's gonna get that steal. He's gonna dive on the ball. Then he's gonna scream in your face. Um, <laughs> same as Raleigh, he's going to get us into the offense. You know, he wants to reverse the ball. He wants to move it. He's going to knock down a shot when he's open. He's going to get to the rim. Um, but for us, what's big with him, how I started it, he's going to get that stop when we need it. Against Loomis, 10 seconds left, we're up one. Maybe a little more time, but they dribbled over half court. He poked it away. He beat two guys to the ball. Then he knocked down the free throws. And before that, he got two 10-second violations in the backcourt. So, you know, that's what he brings. He brings energy and a defensive defensive kind of presence that you don't see a lot. Yeah. So in, you know, reviewing this conglomeration of players and what everyone brings to the table, how would you say the team works together? Like, if someone asks you to describe – the play style of Exeter as a whole, what would you tell them? I would say early on did not describe us um, really good. We really struggled reversing the ball. We wanted the best or the first okay shot instead of using the 30 seconds we have and getting like the best look. And that was kind of us for the first half of the season. Um, But now we're able to move the ball really well defensively we're going to get after you um on ball off ball we're going to be ready that's what we've been working on and on offense we're going to make you defend uh we're going to reverse it a little bit we're going to throw it in then we're going to throw it out then we're going to throw it back in and we're going to make you move side to side try to hit dom for a layup if not if dom doesn't have it he's going to kick it out for a three and that's what we've worked on for the past six weeks probably and now we're kind of getting our rhythm to do it at the perfect time. Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. And break it down for me. You come off the big win, Phillips Andover. We were talking before the interview, just such a historic rivalry. You know, kind of set the stage and tell me how everything went down in that game. From, from the tip, it was crazy. You know, Dom won the tip and our place was going nuts. And, you know, I think we score on the first possession and we started – really well you know our offense didn't you know we didn't hit a lot of shots either um but we went up into halftime I think up either 34 24 or 24 14 where we may not have been scoring our best but our defense was kind of holding holding it down for us so like we went up 10 at halftime and then we came out kind of laid laid an egg uh, for the first two or three minutes and let them back into it they cut it to three and then kind of the rest of the way, you know, obviously the place is going nuts. The rest of the way, I mean, back and forth. They tied it with four minutes to go. And I think I hit a three. We get a stop. Dom gets an and one. They come down. They get a layup. Um, maybe even, like, cut it to two or three. And then we kind of hit free throws down the end where it never kind of got below two or three. But like we're always able to keep it at a two possession game from 30 seconds all the way to zero. I think what's crazy, like what I love about this rivalry is it's two schools that are really known for their academics. Mm. And, you know, right now, like on niche kind of, yeah, niche, Andover, yeah. Andover's ranked one, Exeter's ranked sixth in like the world. Well, unbelievable. So yeah. Andover will chant like number six at us, like safety school, this and that. Oh my God. And like, that's what they want to like talk about during the game. Yeah. 
and then it's like presidents who attended the school being chanted at them, like just like famous authors, writers, just back and forth. Wait, like, they're chanting out, they're chanting out about the presidents that have attended oh, Andover. It, yeah, it's crazy because it's just like two schools that are known for their academics, <laughs> and then they all just come to a basketball game. You're all nerds. You're all nerds. Gosh. <laughs> I was working on finals before, before this call. <laughs> Oh my God. So, so the, I've never heard about that kind of stuff. So it's a high school crowd and they're yelling out about the, the accolades and the accolades of school. Yeah. Now. So what, so what is, what's the exit or response to that being number six, being so far back in the rankings? Like how did, how do you respond to that? I don't really think you have a response. Cause like in the years when we were ranked higher, we were chant, chanted at them. Um, now, I won't lie, when they started chanting number six at us, you know, I didn't know about these rankings. I didn't even know there was <laughs> rankings for like high schools, this or that. So I'm like, I looked at one of my friends and go, what does number six mean? And they go, oh, they rank number one. We're, we are ranked number six on <laughs> niche. I'm just like, why does that matter? Like we're six. <laughs> what? yeah um, i would so be looking at everyone's i would be looking at everyone's jerseys like wait a second who's number six like exactly i was i was confused um our response yesterday because during our game we we're winning for a majority of the game and then like during the girls game after us they were winning for a majority of the game so they would start the chant and then we just go scoreboard right back at them right um, you know we got to storm their court twice as a student section um, twice in one day Twice in one day. Oh my you know, god! Boys won first, then girls were up, girls won. Um, so we ca- we we got them back for that. Mm, damn, that's wild. It's also niche too. That's like such a weird website for the rankings. I mean, is it like? Don't you think like I don't know USA Today? I mean, I don't know that anyone gets to be the authority on the number one school, but niche is like. It just puts together all these weird stuff. I mean, I don't know how they figured that out. If it's SAT scores or college acceptances, I do know like there are some schools with just crazy. Like Andover has that connection to like Harvard and stuff like that. The Ivy League does, does Exeter have similar things? Like, are a lot of your classmates going to attend the Ivy League schools after this? Yeah, I think a lot of my classmates are going. They want to go to Ivy or a school out in California to one of like the UC schools. Mm. Um, so they're definitely looking at a lot of high academic schools that I didn't really want to look at, but <laughs> we were different in that aspect. <laughs> is it is it engaging and like good for intellectual curiosity to be at a top school with brilliant teachers and being surrounded by kids that have, you know, intelligence and are, are sort of worldly? No question. Because um, when you walk into class, you never know like who you're sitting next to. You know, like you might be sitting next to a future lawyer, doctor, maybe even like a president um, because of like kind of the goals they have for themselves. And then, you know, we have like this Harkness method. I think Dom mentioned it on his where it's all discussion based. It's like the teacher kind of sits out and the class teaches each other either on a reading, poem, math problem, um, and you just talk about it. And that's really interesting because you get to like pick the minds of other people. You have all these different ideas that just come into, come onto a table and you just let it all go. Like, oh, well, this is what I thought of this. Well, I agree with you, but we could also look at it like this. Mm. Um, so you have Dom, some Dom was Dom was ripping it on a little. Did are, are you with Dom that you don't think it's that strong of a method or do you like it? Mm, I could go either way because I'm definitely – when I first got to Exeter my sophomore year, I was definitely more like the type of kid that's going to participate in class three, four times. You know, I was a talker. I hated just sitting there being lectured the whole time. Um, and then kind of COVID happened. I was online, kind of started my downfall to participate in <laughs> class. Yeah. And now I might be lucky to say one or two things in class. <laughs> um, but I don't uh, mind. You're not alone in that, man. The COVID, the participation, and then being your last year in school like exactly like pe- people get it but um I like it because I was never the type of kid who could just listen to a teacher talk for 50 minutes then get a five minute break then go to the next class where a teacher's going to talk for 50 more minutes mm-hmm. um and do that for seven hours in a day yeah 
Yeah, I see where you're coming from too. And it's nice, like you said, you get to engage with other people's ideas, hear what people say. And you're right that if you do that all day long, like you can't, like you get burned unless you've got some crazy, you know, attention, the attention abilities and you're actually engaged in the topic. Or if you have, if you have like brilliantly engaging teachers, but you know, everyone has that experience of like, you just, you just tune out. You ever like you fix your, you ever just like fix your eyes at the front of the room and just like, you're not there. You're not present. Like I do that all the time. Oh, all the time. So like when I was at the high school, Exeter high school, the public school, no, I was, I, I normally sat in the back of the class. I'll come clean here. My mom probably thinks I sat in the front. Um, I would, I would stare at the board. I'd be looking at the board, but I wouldn't really say I was writing down the notes. Um, I was always kind of playing catch up in that aspect where I would miss about five minutes of the notes. Then I'd look down my paper. I wouldn't have anything. So I just start writing everything that was on the board and then I'd catch up and then I'd go back to like the zone out for five more minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, I've fallen asleep once in a class <laughs> and it was the one class that I sat front row oh, and it was God. so bad. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Cause I didn't, you don't realize when you wake up that you fell asleep or like, you just hope and pray nobody noticed, <laughs> but I'm just like, I'm front row closest to my teacher's desk. Like you've got to call out. And then she let me sleep. She let you sleep. Yeah, she she didn't wake me up. So, <laughs> oh my god, I you know what I there was a I'm the guy like I've helped out so many people. I'm the guy that taps you awake, and I remember I was in this like uh, class. What was it? Yeah, it was a, a American military history last semester, and this dude in the front row clocked out, and like <laughs> this teacher's pet kid that's always raising his hand. And it's like acting like acting like he should be teaching the class. And I'm like, all right, pal. So I see this kid clocked out again. And then like the teacher's pet kid is like looking at him. And this kid's like, he's like making noise. He's like, he's like snoring a little bit. And I just thought to myself, you are the biggest asshole for not topping this kid awake in front yeah. of the, he's just, it, it was a 8 30 AM class too. So I was like, it's just like this poor kid just probably didn't get enough sleep. And like, you're just letting him snore. Just terrible. So the teacher's pet wouldn't tap him? No, he wouldn't help him out. I mean, that might be the kid to tell the teacher. Like, raise his hand and be like, hey, the dude next to me sleeping right now. I just thought I would let him know. <laughs> yeah, thinking it'll get him <laughs> extra credit or something. Exactly. A few more points on that final or whatever. Are, are, you, on, are you on TikTok? I am. Do you ever hear that, that one audio? where it's like, it's like that one kid in class and then it's them just talking and they're saying so much, but they're not saying anything. Yes. You're like, oh, actually, I believe this speaks to the, the duality of man. It's just like, shut the fuck. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because like, you know, I've been caught like sometimes doing that too, but like with the, like this Harkness style, mm -hmm. there's always a point being repeated just in different words, you mm -hmm. know, just to get your participation points from your teacher you know i definitely done it a few times where like i'd wait a few minutes then say the exact same point as somebody else said just no the best way to is act like you're contributing the conversation so you can be like yeah i actually want to hop on what josh said because i think it's really yeah. interesting and then you like you said you just restate what he said but in different words you're just yeah, exactly wikipedia and then you're just like changing it up exactly or just ask a little question like <laughs> Clar cl a clarifying question you get participation points for it a clarifying question oh yeah and the teacher's just like all about that question They're like, oh exactly. yeah here we go you're like we're you're like this is just what socrates wanted this <laughs> seminar like people are asking questions now like oh oh geez yeah and then college i mean do you, is wofford lecture halls is it smaller class size i, I don't know much about it I think they have some lectures, um, but they're more so smaller class sizes. So you get like a pretty good relationship uh, with your teachers. Um, and I was told like the teachers really want to help you out and see you succeed. Uh, so that's something I'm looking forward to. Mm, yeah, that must have been an exciting part of it, too, is considering the basketball, but also the academics. Are you like you were talking about all your friends at Exeter? You never know like what goals someone has. 
were you are you someone that's like man I want to be involved in I mean if you don't know you don't know because you're young enough that you don't need to know um but like do you have aspirations like oh I want to be a lawyer or I want to be a basketball coach like like your uh like your dad you know what I'm saying or do, do you have any aspirations yeah well my plan a is obviously play basketball for as long as I can um you know that's definitely what I want to do um and then if not I think I'm going to go into I don't really know what I'm going to major in I think I'm leaning towards English a little bit um and maybe be like an English teacher and I would love to be a basketball coach one day um perfect so combo the, yeah, the, 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 the teacher, teacher coach, coach is such a good life exactly so that's kind of what I was leaning towards but I'm not I'm not going to fall back to that just yet because I got four years of basketball and hopefully a lot more after that. Yeah. Is the NBA in your mind at all? Like that that's a possibility? Obviously, that's like the ultimate goal is like make it to the league. Um, we'll, we'll kind of see where the next four years take us. Right. Uh, I think it's fair to say, man. I mean, anyone that's playing Division One basketball, I feel like, you know, you're, you're set up, you're in the position, you're on the path. Exactly. Um, so either that or like, I'm not opposed to going overseas at all. Um, you know, they got some great leagues overseas that I would want you get to see the another part of the world that you never thought you'd see. And then you know, hoop, you up. hoop up, play the game you love. So, yeah, that's like how we were talking about uh, how we both uh, interacted with um Mike Martin, coach Mike Martin out of Brown, and he actually played in Ireland and he said it was like the best year of his life. Like mm -hmm. he said, he made great friends and he, um, I want to say he played at, he played at some Ivy League school. So yeah, like, um, and then he went and played Ireland. There's so many good leagues, opportunities, places to play. I mean, yeah, it'd be crazy. Would you go somewhere like, would you be like the Ball Brothers and go to like a Lithuania or would you be like, have to be like in England or somewhere where you like, speak the language and stuff no I, I would look into it you know just to keep playing basketball i don't think it doesn't matter for me i just want to play so for sure. play and win do you have a favorite nba player i i love tatum mm -hmm. jason tatum did you see him on uh jj reddick's podcast i see him sometimes i don't see like the full clips but i see like little clips you gotta watch the whole thing man it was it was wicked good all right, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have to go do that. And it, and it works, too, because J.J. Redick, like, former player, like, he, he just connects in a way and gets guys comfortable, like, when, you know, like, the local, like, Nesson or, like, NBC, like, or, like, Herald Reporter is like, hey, like, Tatum, what do you think about everyone saying that you and Jalen Brown, like, don't play well together, like, that you play too much iso ball? He'll just say something like, oh, I'm not, like, I'm not worrying about that or something but when you're on jj reddick's podcast like he's literally like what do you think about that and he's like oh i think it's kind of silly for people to want to get rid of like the two like great young players in the nba and he was saying like how they both want to be in boston i was like wow you're getting like so much more information and i'm a Celtics guy so i absolutely like ate that podcast up exactly what did you what do you think about the Celtics season um until recently, until about the last six, 14 games, I, I had to turn them off because I would get so frustrated. <laughs> you know, they'd go up 15 going into the fourth. The next thing you knew, they were down 10. And they were terrible. They didn't move it well. Um, this new guy from San Antonio, White, I think is doing a great job so far. He moves the ball. Obviously, coming from San Antonio, that's a great pro great organization there. Right. Um, and I think they've been playing great these last 16 games. Hopefully they can catch that four seed soon. I know they had a tough loss tonight, but um, mm -hmm. I know they're chasing the 3-4 right now. And they, they stay on this, what are they, 12-2 and two run yeah. that they're on? Yeah. It, yeah, and that Nets, I don't know if you caught the Nets on Thursday night, but that game was amazing. The Celtics have, like, best they've looked all season. Mm -hmm. Obviously tonight with the Pacers, I was like, I was finishing up the game right before I hopped on the interview with Logan. And I was just like, oh, you hate to see the momentum to lose to a team like the Pacers. Exactly. The dumbest teams, like right before the, right before the, uh, the all-star break, we lost to, um, who do we lose to? Like the, the Pistons or like the trail? We lost to someone just trash. And I was like, we lost by one point to blow our like 
12 game win streak and I was I was not pleased yeah exactly you you can't lose to the Pacers right now <laughs> yeah uh, so yeah we might as well wrap up because I I know you don't want to miss the new episode of euphoria that came out tonight and uh, um, I'm not gonna I'm, I'll keep it 100 I haven't watched a single episode of euphoria <laughs> <laughs> I I figured out that's an ongoing joke I'll ask I'll ask I'll ask guys on the podcast oh do you like euphoria and they no, and then like I had one guy who was like, "Oh yeah, I love Euphoria," and I actually watch Euphoria. It's a crazy so, show. So we had like Spirit Week this week, obviously getting ready for the game, and we had like Euphoria Day, and everyone's like, "Josh, you should be like this character, like this character," and I couldn't even like tell you their names now, and I was like, "Who is that?" And they were like, "Josh, you like my outfit," and I'm like, "Yeah, but I don't really know who you are. Like I've never seen these characters, I've never seen the show, and I was so confused." You, Euphoria Day sounds like an absolute recipe for like dress code violations. Like, oh, they made sure to mention in the email there will be no dress codes. So um, people do whatever they wanted. Wow. That's wild. So, I mean, yeah, I just, for anyone that's seen Euphoria, like not appropriate outfits, <laughs> not appropriate <laughs> outfits. So that's, I find that a m- miraculous that you guys had a Euphoria Day. That's yeah. pretty hilarious. Anyways, but yeah, so um, before we wrap up, last question I'd love to hit on. Um, what would you say to someone out there listening to this that's like, wow, like Josh is a great player. He's a D1 commit. You know, maybe this is a kid early high school or they're in middle school. That's my dream too. I want to be just like Josh. I want to play D1. I want to get buckets. I want to play varsity at my high school. Like what's your advice to that young basketball player to get to where you're at right now? Yeah, I would just say to them, well, one, you know, your dreams are never too far out of reach. It all It's all going to depend on how hard you work. If you really want something, you got to go get it. Um, for me, playing multiple sports really helped me growing up. Playing football kind of taught me the mental aspects of kind of a big game in basketball. Um, pitching in a big game in baseball, every pitch gets you ready for those big free throws at the end of the game. And being able to combine those, um, it's staying. It's being the first one in the gym for practice and staying late, getting extra shots up. Um, right now, if you have a free period, like I, like I have a good amount of free time during the day where I'm in the gym all the time. So it's like the hard work never stops. Mm. Um, it's how you treat your body, from what you eat to stretching, recovery, this and that. But mainly, it's kind of your mindset on things. If you have the mindset that you can go be a division one basketball player, then go do it. You know, there's certain steps along the way, set little goals for yourself every day, every week, every month, you know, that are going to get you better. And then, you know, over time, that's going to set you up to achieve that big goal. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. You know, I think that was the most important thing to me, set little goals for yourself that you can, that's going to help you reach that ultimate dream. Well said, Josh, thanks so much for coming on the Young Shakespeare podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. That has been this episode of the Young Shakespeare Podcast. Thanks so much to Josh for coming on. Thanks to everyone who's been listening, liking, watching, and subscribing. And please tune in to the next episode of the podcast.